So I'll share this uh, the screen, and I will I will kind of present uh, present this uh, this meeting. So so I will I will kind of maybe I mean many many of you might know the the Human Protein Atlas project, but just kind of take a little bit along. In, in, in kind of a little bit of a brief overview of, of what we do and what we have and what we offer. So I would say our main mission is to map the expression and distribution of all human proteins in organs, tissues, cells, and make this data publicly available. So make this data available for the uh, research community. And that's something that we have been doing for a very long time. So the project started in 2003, uh, mainly as a antibody centered uh, approach to kind of really be able to uh, to visualize all proteins at the level of tissues but also later on we moved and we kind of adapted many of the new technologies that uh, that, that came along so uh, and i think what you can do when you talk about distribution there's of course different levels in which you can describe um, uh, distribution so of course you can talk at the level of, of organs and tissues and that's one of the things we started already from from quite early on is that we started to or we, we aim to include all main human tissues and be able to look at the cells which are present and the proteins that they express. Um, and that's also what you can find on the, on the protein atlas, which is kind of our core still. It's a, it's a tissue section where you can find both RNA expression, but also protein expression, where we kind of score proteins, we kind of score cells, and you can find lots of information about what cells express the protein of interest. Um, but of course, also we know that many of the tissues, they are kind of complex, they, comp they comprise of multiple different cell types, uh, especially brain, which is the part, the organ which I'm working on most, we know there's different cells, which have different functions, and to do these different functions, they need different proteins, and, and to kind of look at this level of, of uh, distribution is, of course, the next thing to do, and there, um, we already provided some data, so we already had some antibody data where you can already, based on the on the staining, on the on the antibody binding, you can identify quite a few cell types, but it's kind of tricky sometimes because you have to really look at morphology and sometimes proteins are not really staining the entire cells, which makes it very difficult to, to interpret the data and to link a protein to, to a cell type. So the technologies of the single cells, which we heard a lot about this morning, is, um, is, is really aiming for, for, for kind of closing that gap and, and really try to find the full transcriptome profile of individual cells, which can really kind of tell us and guide us in, in what those cells are and what their functions could be. Uh, and also this, this data that we, that we kind of provide in the Human Protein Atlas project, not so much data that we generate ourselves, but, but we really kind of utilize the, the huge amount of data which has been, uh, which has been donated or published uh, on, the, on, the, um, uh, on, on, on kind of the, the open source or in different um, uh, databases, which we then try to incorporate and, and really try to integrate all these data sets and, and try to make a kind of a larger overview of where proteins are expressed and where mRNA can be found. So that's the, um, uh, the, the next step, of course, is that also when you think about, about function, it's not, only, it's not only what the cell expresses and what proteins the cell expresses, but also to ex some extent and to a large extent also where the proteins can be found. So where are the proteins active? So in what kind of cellular processes are these proteins uh, participating? And this is, of course, one thing which cannot be done at the level of mRNA. Maybe to some extent it can, but, but in general, you really need to look at the proteins. And there's also one of the things we try to really provide data is where you can look at the proteins uh, at the site of action and try to uh, kind of incorporate the data into the, the, kind, the kind of view on, on how, how a protein uh, is involved in, in basic physiology. So, um, and then of course, this is an example, this is from the cell uh, subcell atlas where even we kind of clustered uh, proteins based on their subcell location. So this is all kinds of information which is, is available at the, at the human protein atlas. It's not all information, but kind of just the kind of the main, the main um, levels in which we try to collect information. So if you go to the current version of the, of the human protein atlas project, so uh, which is version 21 released in uh, November last year, so you see that we kind of now have 10, uh, 10 sections and many of those sections have all been published as well. So we kind of often release a section or a new section and, and have a publication kind of um, uh, coming along with it. Um, but if you look at the, uh, the sections, then we kind of really try to, to organize. So the tissue section is really still the most popular section. So in total, the Human Protein Atlas project gets about 400,000 visitors every month, but the tissue atlas is the 
is the kind of the section or tissue section is the one that gets most most attention still because it has such a large amount of, of data and it's also of course relevant for many fields of biological research. Uh, but also we have a brain section which is the section which, which my group is, is mainly responsible for. Uh, we have a single cell section where I showed some data where you can look at that kind of integrated single cell data, try to see where the, where the genes are. Um, we also use other approaches. So we have a tissue cell type where it's more based on correlations to see which genes are correlating to which genes and how can you kind of uh, identify cell types expression uh, based on this correlation. Uh, we have a pathology atlas, which is mainly focused on cancers. Um, we have an immune cell atlas, which is again a single cell type of atlas, where, but then focused on the different immune cells and the genes that they express. But also we look at, for instance, things which are secreted in the blood. So also we are looking at secreted proteins. So predicted we can, we can based on, on sequence and the things that we know, we can predict there's about 3,000 proteins which are released. Uh, many of them are released in the blood, not all of them. So uh, to kind of, you know, map these ones, characterize these ones. And um, so there's also one thing that you can find in, in the blood protein atlas. I showed some examples of the subcellular atlas. Um, and also we, we have some data, which is kind of uh, just transcriptomics data on, on cell lines. Uh, and also in the co collaboration with, um, um, with, the, um, with the University of Göteborg, we have also a metabolic atlas where we can also provide data where you can look at metabolic pathways. So you can really integrate metabolic pathways into, into our, um, our protein uh, distribution data. So, so this is kind of the flavors that we all try to try to um, to kind of uh, provide uh, given researchers the opportunity to really go and, and look and find as much information about their genes of interest uh, as possible. So, um, and also if you can see that, you know, uh, if it comes to coverage. So as I said in the beginning, we are, we were kind of an antibody centered uh, um, um, kind of uh, effort, but um, so we have lots of antibody data available. Um, covering most of the proteins, not all of them. So there's still a few proteins which are quite difficult to, uh, to target. And these, of course, include olfactory receptors and other types of, uh, of very rare, rare proteins that are difficult to find. But in general, we kind of have a more or less complete picture of protein distribution in the, in the human body. So that's the kind of the, the, the first part that I, I wanted to share uh, with you, just kind of a brief overview. So then uh, when it comes to, to the brain section and the part that I'm working on, on mostly is, is something that kind of started because we knew that it's difficult to, to catch the whole brain um, because it's such a, such a heterogeneous uh, organ. So, so we started a kind of a, um, a study where we, uh, where we aim to get a more of a, of a complete overview of, um, of protein expression distribution in, in the brain. So our first approach was is to use and integrate different data from different data sets, all human, but also of, of different species to kind of get an overview of the mammalian brain and where different genes are expressed. And this is mainly based on, on bulk transcriptomics, uh, but also phantom data, so also based on cage. So we really, really looked for all available data sets and tried to integrate and try to get a good coverage because one of the problems is, is that if you look, so here we have different data sets, but one of the things is that even when we combine all those data sets, you still see that in these middle lines, the cage and the RNA-seq on human, we still have a lot of wide gaps. It's very difficult to, to find uh, samples on everything, but at least we try to have uh, samples representing the main structures within the brain, even though they were not detailed. Um, but then as you can see as well from the, from the pig, this is a collaboration with BGI and also from the mouse, we could really, really try to get a full coverage of the entire brain um, and, and collect several samples. So um, this was a major normalization exercise. So I think I, I can almost say that, that maybe the Human Protein Atlas is world champion when it comes to normalization, because these have been, these been, have, have been things that have been working on a lot. Um, so try to integrate and normalize data and to make it kind of aligned, um, which is something that we, that we have to do. But I think at the end, if you can look at this, um, at this uh, UMAP plot, we can see a quite nice uh, success where we couldn't even find the different methods and platforms, uh, but really we could see that the samples were clustering based on their uh, on their location rather than on their methods which were used for analysis. So we use it to kind of make a 
a kind of basic outline of the mammalian brain and look at different regions, look at similarities, look at differences uh, between species. But also here we already noticed that, uh, especially for very complex reasons like hypothalamus and, and the brainstem, it was very difficult to uh, align our data because there was just too much thing, things missing. So when things were not kind of um, uh, similar between species, we didn't know whether it was due to sampling or it was due to the fact that these were actually species differences. But for some regions where we knew that we had good overlap, we could identify them. And these are mainly the, um, the um, cerebellum, basal ganglion, and cortical regions where we knew that we had good overlap and matching samples where we could really investigate these, uh, these differences. So, um, so it was kind of interesting to see that if you kind of look and you compare species, I would say, or just kind of make a very short summary of, 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 of our findings that you see is in the top figure, you see that the level of transcription factors the drivers of gene expression, you see quite little variation. There's variation, but <clears throat> it's very limited. But if you look at things like receptors, things that give us functions, things that are kind of drug targets for, 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 uh, for many uh, therapeutics, you see quite a lot of variation. <clears throat> and, and some examples, as you can see here, for instance, is you see the, uh, the mu opiate receptor, which is quite, quite highly expressed in the, in the human cerebellum, where you don't find this receptor to be expressed in the cerebellum in, in both pig and mouse. Uh, and there were quite a few other, other examples. And for instance, if you look at nicotinic receptor subunit and the distribution of those subunits within the, uh, within the brain, also there you see that everything which is written in the textbook, often based on the rodents, is not true for all species. So I think it's also one of the things that really indicated that we need to study the human brain in more detail in order to, to learn more about, about, um, about how the human brain functions because it's not a big mouse brain, but actually there's a lot of, a lot of difference between species, which might, of course, explain some of the failed, um, failed uh, trials of, of curing some of the diseases. Uh -huh. So that's kind of shortly in conclusion. So I think we, 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 we made a good start and we were able to, to, find, um, to find similarities and differences which, which were really, um, and I think also quite a few with, with biological relevance. But still we felt that we, we, we couldn't really be conclusive about many other findings that we had because of the, of the sampling uh, issues. So then we started on, on version two. So we wanted to improve it. And, and still we're working on, on bulk, but, but now what we are, we are doing is we are adding more and more samples, but also we wanted to have samples which had a clear anatomical boundary or border. So we wanted to know what was in our samples, because as many of you know, if kind of the, the kind of classical way of sampling for bulk RNA-seq would be to take a frozen tissue block to cut a few sections from that block on the cryostat and collect those sections and, and do your analysis. So here we collaborate with Professor uh, Balkowicz in Hungary, who developed a micro dissection punching method already in the 70s of the last century, which is a method where he can clearly punch out small little groups of cells and, and have very clear uh, nuclei. And these are the samples that we, uh, that we, um, that we obtained from, uh, from him. So we got about 1,300 samples, which were all punched. And these 1,300 samples, they cover about 200 regions of the human brain. And also what was quite good is that we could have them only of a, of a small number of, of donors. This also means that we could kind of look at individual variation and kind of correct for it. So get a very clean, um, clean uh, kind of overview of, of differences in gene expression at the level of, of regions and subregions. Um, we are kind of in the middle of, of analyzing this data and, and really trying to extract all the uh, biological data from it. But you can see here, and I hope you can appreciate it, that already you see that and you can see with different colors is that when you look at all those regions of the brain, you can see a quite nice clustering based on their gene expression. So I think we had a, we are able to really get a very good quality results where we can really see how, how similar certain regions and subregions are to each other and, and how, how gene expression, at least at, at the overall, is, is kind of uh, regulated within the, uh, within the human brain. And this is something that, as I said, we are, we are working on as well. Um, and also, I think here as well in this, this dendrogram, you can also hopefully appreciate that you can see how similar samples from cortex, for instance, are to each other. And you can see also in other colors that other parts of the, of the brain are more similar. But also what you can already see here is that, for instance, here in light blue, we have the basal ganglia. You can see that there are several clusters of basal ganglia regions which are more similar uh, to each other than, um, than, than to others. So also, I think this will kind of help us to further subdivide the kind of molecular organization of the brain by looking both at anatomy, but also looking at the molecular composition. 
Um, so um, so that, that's one of the things that, as I said, we are working on now and we are quite, quite happy with the data, even though bulk is maybe not the most interesting and, and uh, uh, and most highly appreciated type of, of uh, transcriptomics at the moment, but I still think that with this data we, we, we were able to or are able to to uh, provide new views on the organization of the brain. So that's a little bit of of um, of what we have done so far. So if you would go to HPA twenty one, which is uh, which is uh, online now, the data is already available. So we already, even though as I said, we are still working on. Um, on analyzing the data, but the data is, is available, so it can, be, it can be explored. But also I want everybody to be aware. So I saw many people, of course, showing examples of brain. So brain always seems to be a favorable organ for many molecular biologists to, to kind of study and to, to look at things because it's interesting functionally, uh, but also, of course, there's lots of cells. And um, so, but there's a lot of challenges when it comes to brain. Uh, and one of them, as I kind of already indicated, is the loss of heterogeneity, not only between cells, but also between regions. So it's difficult to cover it all. If you want to cover it all, then it takes, it takes lots, of, uh, lots of samples and lots of energy. Um, also, one of the things we learned is that the brain expresses maybe 80% or more of our transcripts. But many of those transcripts are expressed at quite low levels. This also means that you have to sequence a lot. You have to have a lot of depth. You have to really make sure that you kind of pick up, you get all those transcripts. Um, then for some technologies like single cell, I mean, the brain cannot really be analyzed that way because the cells are so complex in their morphology, um, which of course makes it very easy to extract them um, and to get them from, from, the, from the tissue. But also, it's also something which makes it quite difficult to correlate between proteins and, and RNAs because many proteins are transported into distal uh, processes of the cells where the mRNAs stay very close to the, to the nucleus. So these are all complications which somehow we have to deal with uh, working, uh, working on brain. So here is an example of how HPA21 on the brain section looked like and, and, and kind of just to see uh, an indication. So we, we kind of organize the brain into 13 main regions. Um, and then you can kind of look into each of the individual subregions to see with, with, uh, what kind of is, is the expression. This is tyrosine hydroxylase, the enzyme responsible for the production of dopamine and, and noradrenaline. And you can see clearly that, if, for instance, if you look at the level of bonds, you can see that locus ceruleus, uh, the, 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 the nucleus for, for neurodynamic cells, has a very high expression. So I think we, we looked at a lot of data, and I think it looks all very, uh, very, very nice and, and, and good. So, um, and then, of course, it comes to the next step. And, and that's also the reason that we are all here together, is to kind of explore the, the development of, of a new technology giving us a spatial and temporal um, resolution and, and things that we can achieve with this. Um, and I kind of like to, to put back the main mission uh, on the screen, which is that we wanted to, to map the expression distribution of all human proteins at the level of organs, tissues, and cells, uh, and make this data publicly available. And, and as, as I've shown in a few slides, we are kind of doing it with antibodies, which kind of gives us a lot of information, but also we, we did bulk RNA-seq, we use single cell or single nuclear RNA-seq. And I think each of this, those methods have, have advantages and, and disadvantages, but as I see it, the, the stereo-seq has a lot, of, a lot of advantages and even maybe more potential uh, of, of what can be achieved by using this method and by using uh, it to, to kind of answer our question, questions and, and kind of participate in, in fulfilling our, our main mission. So, uh, and I think especially when it comes to completeness, we are able to, to get all cells. I mean, with single nuclear, you never know what you get. Some, you know, some, some cells don't even like to be isolated. So it's, it's, a, very, it's a very tricky uh, tricky business to be able to, to, to use it and to kind of put all the cells back together and try to reconstruct your sample. Um, also, if we know that single nuclear, nuclear RNA is not really um, kind of representative for the total mRNA. Um, so that's, that's something that also is something that the spatial transcriptomics or the studio seek will, will kind of overcome. Uh, but also the possibility to combine it. So we've so seen some examples of how you can combine it with antibodies. Um, and I think that would be something that is, uh, is, is, is really, really promising. Uh, I think one of the things, uh, so if it comes to, um, to our kind of challenges um, and, and, and tasks, I think the and, and I think we have talked a lot about it in, in many of the talks when it comes to computational approaches and data analysis, 
um, is to really be able to use the chip resolution to obtain true single cell data. And that, that I think is the, that, that's key. I mean, we do a lot of approaches. We try to use different things, but at the end you would either use segmentation or some other computational approach to be able to say that, you know, this data is really from a single cell. And now we have enough depth and we have so much information from that cell that we can really start building our, our models and, and really start to under, understand how, how the brain works. Um, I think a combination with antibodies could be, could be useful in that sense because it could maybe help with segmentation. Uh, we, we know that there are several nice antibodies uh, outlining uh, neurons and, and things like that. Uh, but also you could think about combining antibodies to ask questions. And these are the things that I would be really interested in is to see so what happens if, for instance, in Alzheimer's disease, a cell gets entangled? So what happens? So what kind of changes in transcri transcription do we see? Uh, and these, of course, we need to have something to identify those post-translational changes. So there's also one thing where I see that we could really, really go and, and answer those questions. Uh, but also, I've, I've, I've heard a lot about data analysis and trying to find, but also I think we have to really start thinking about is how are we going to share all those data with, with the kind of the public and how do we make it as easy accessible and how, how as, as, as interactive as possible and how can we really kind of make this the, the new standard for, for the future. And I think it's also one of the things that I would be really, really happy to, to participate and, and to think, uh, think along with, with all other members of the, of the consortium. So that's kind of what I, what I had in mind to, to kind of um, uh, present to you today. But I also wanted to, of course, say that, I mean, the Human Protein Atlas, as I said, it's, it's been active for many, many years, so since 2003. Um, I think in total, there's been more than 1,000 people years invested into the, into the project. Um, and, and you can see, so there's always a number of around 100 people uh, involved in, in the project. Um, so that's, it's, a, it's a great, great, um, great to be part of it. And I think also things that have been achieved is, is difficult, I think, to achieve on, on, um, on kind of national funding. So it's really the Kluton Allard Wallenberg Foundation. I really want to thank because they have been investing so much into, into our project. Um, and that has been, has been great. Um, so, and also of course, um, so these are the, the, the kind of the people responsible for the different sections. Um, I also want to thank my group. So I have my group of, um, of, of, of people, uh, both bad lab, immunistic chemistry, but also bioinformatics. So it's nice to have a kind of group together with different disciplines. And I think we work very nicely as a team. So that's, that's very nice. Uh, and of course, my collaboration with, with PGI has been great. Um, so we have been working on the PIC, uh, the single cell data uh, with the macaques. Um, so there's lots of, lots of interactions and it's, it's great to work with, with, with people from BGI. And it's been a great joy. And I hope to visit China again uh, at some point now all pandemics are over. Um, and also, um, I want to thank uh, of, of, uh, Thomas Hockfeld, which is a professor of neuroscience, uh, which has been my mentor for many years. Uh, Professor Miklos Palkovic, who has been uh, donating the samples, and also Dr. Van Zom, who left the Human Protein Atlas to start her own uh, group at, at Lin Shipping and has been involved in many of the bioinformatics uh, analysis of, uh, of our samples. So thank you very much, and I would be happy to answer any questions. <laughs>